Moliere, who was born Jean-Baptiste Poquelin, has been called the Shakespeare of France. He was a very significant 17th century French playwright. He was born in 1622 in Paris, died in 1673 in the same city at the age of 51. His influence was such that French has sometimes been called the language of Moliere. He was born not into a wealthy family, but his father was the king's upholsterer, so they weren't terribly poor, and Jean-Baptiste was able to get an education. He studied at the Jesuit College of Clermont. He studied law there and was also exposed to theater for the first time. And though he worked with his father for a little while, he eventually left all that and went on the road as a traveling actor. He spent 13 years on the road, and that's where he developed his skills both in acting and in writing drama. He learned both the Commedia dell'arte, which we'll talk about a little bit, as well as elements of French comedy. Commedia dell'arte is a kind of theater that was popular in Italy in the 1500s to the 1700s, and it was partially scripted and partially improvised, and it used stock characters. There would be a scheming servant or a military officer who had a lot of bravado, maybe false bravado, and these same characters would appear in different plays. It's likely that Jean-Baptiste changed his name to Moliere in order to let his father avoid the shame of being known as having an actor in his family, because at the time, actors reportedly could not be buried in sacred ground. They couldn't be buried in churchyards. In 1658, so Moliere is about 36 by this time, he makes his way back to Paris and had an opportunity to perform for Louis XIV in the Louvre. And the performance went well, and he essentially had the king's support for the rest of his life. That may have in part been because he was always careful in his plays not to criticize the king, though he did write some things that upset some other people. For example, his rendition of Don Juan upset the clergy and... The run was ended after 15 performances, though it was popular among the public, and it was never restaged. Moliere apparently had a coughing fit on stage one night in the middle of a performance, and he insisted on continuing. And he did finish the performance, but then he died a few hours after that. After he died, Moliere's wife asked the king if he could be buried in the sacred ground of a cemetery, something that was against French law at the time. And the king permitted his body to be buried in the part of the cemetery reserved for unbaptized infants. To read some Moliere, I picked up a two-volume set published by the Library of America of translations by Richard Wilbur, who's a great American poet and literary translator. The set was $53. And if you think of it as two hardcover books, which it is, and it also came with a box, that puts it at about $26 for each book, or 25 with tax. Which is a little expensive, but it's not terrible. And I would say, now having read the first volume, and I've started the second, these are worth every penny. Both the print quality and the translation are phenomenal. They're printed on acid-free paper, which if you don't know, in the late 19th century, they developed a means of making paper that used a kind of acid, that was cheaper, but the paper falls apart sooner. Most books are still printed on acidic paper because using acid-free paper is much more expensive, but it also lasts a lot longer. It's hard to find exact information, but what I usually find is that acidic paper will last between 40 and 100 years, and acid-free paper can last between 500 to 1,000 years if you take care of it. But that's almost certainly part of the reason why this printing by Library of America was a little bit more expensive than some other editions. And Library of America is a nonprofit organization whose goal is to make high quality editions of these kinds of classic books. So I doubt that they're doing much price gouging on this. And they have a set of books that I'm sure you would recognize if you saw it, these hardcover black editions with the name of the author in white and sometimes an image and it's got a little red white and blue band 
around the bottom. And there'll be, for example, Emerson or another very well-known author. It'll be a collection of that author's writings, usually. I'm sure you've seen these. They're all over the place. But this edition of Moliere that I got from them was not in that format, though it was hardcover, but the cover is a little bit more ornate than those ones. Anyway, the first thing to talk about was the printing of the book, which I really liked. And when we were printing our edition of Frankenstein, we looked into using acid-free paper, but it was going to be significantly more expensive. And since the printing of Frankenstein was the first printing that we did, I decided that we should wait and maybe we can try that in the future once we've sold a few more books. But this was the first time since having researched acid-free paper last year or so that I encountered acid-free paper again. And even just touching it and looking at it, it feels and looks different. And it really is worth it, I think, especially when, more importantly, you consider that it lasts longer. And I think that acid-free paper is better from an environmental perspective as well, though I don't remember why that was. Now, as important as all that is, what's even more important is the translation that I read. This was a translation by Richard Wilbur, who I had not encountered before, and it was just astonishing. I think I've said on this podcast that reading plays is usually not my favorite thing. I'm not sure why that is. It might just be that I had to read some plays in high school English class and I didn't care for them. But I was ready for this to be difficult. I was ready to have to push to get through some plays of Moliere. And it was not difficult at all. And I'm sure that's in part because of Moliere, but it's also because of this really excellent translation. Wilbur, as I mentioned, was a poet as well as a translator. And so he translated these verse plays of Moliere. He translated 10 of them. I've read the first six. And the translation is so enjoyable to read. I don't want to say easy to read because it's not as if he's translated it into Twitter speak or something that it's just really dumbed down. It's not dumbed down, but there's something about it that's very enjoyable and comfortable to read. And in the edition, they included an interview with Wilbur, with the translator. There he talks a little bit about how he works. And I think that the way that you get a translation like this is you have a very smart guy working very carefully on it. It doesn't happen on its own. So I always like to acknowledge the translator, even if the translation does not seem like anything very special, even if they just conveyed the writing into another language. That by itself is a big task. But when you have a translation like this one, or like last week we were looking at Simon Armitage and his translation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight that are literary translations, it's a poet also doing a translation. We have that in both cases. And actually the thing that I'm reading now is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow translating Dante. So that'll be a third one, though that one's older. These two are more modern. Literary translation when it's done well, is also worth acknowledging as a skill within a skill. And the first thing about the six plays that I read is that all of them are funny. They're not all comedies, exactly, but they all have at least some jokes in them. And some of them, like The Bungler, are just jokes from beginning to end. And they're quite funny. When I was reading these, I laughed out loud sitting in my chair more than I have watching comedy film in a long time. One of the ways that I read a book is I use book darts. I don't know if you've heard of these. And I'm mentioning these products, except for my own books on my website. I'm not making any money from any of this, so I'm not promoting anything that I get any money from. But book darts are these little metal things that you stick on the side of the page so that you can see what you've marked. And then you can also remove them later. That's part of what I like about them. And you can reuse them. Some people use little colored sticky notes I've never liked doing that, but some people do. But I use book darts just to mark something that caught my attention for one reason or another. And then when I come here to talk to you about it, I've gone through and picked out the ones that I thought were the most interesting, and I skipped over the ones that I didn't think were as interesting. And often, I have so much material that I even have to cut out a lot that I think is interesting, but I just don't have enough time, because I do try to keep these to about an hour. And in looking at the passages that I marked in these plays, a lot of them were the funny parts, which I'm not going to sit here and explain to you why this or that thing was funny. That would be insufferable. But know that there are a lot of good jokes in these plays and 
that might be part of why they're so easy to read and why I couldn't stop myself. I'm now reading the second volume because between obviously the excellent plays and the good translation and the nice print quality, it's really a very enjoyable reading experience. And also in these six plays, there are not confusing plots, but lots of misunderstanding that would make them a little bit difficult or time-consuming to summarize. But I read six plays, and I recommend all of them. They are The Bungler, Lover's Quarrels, The Imaginary Cuckold, The School for Husbands, The School for Wives, and Don Juan. And they do have some twists and turns in them, so that's another reason not to go into them in too much detail. But we can draw some cultural and historical knowledge from them about the time in which they were written and what people thought at that time. And one example of this is that in The Bungler, which was published in 1655, the character Mascari, who is not himself the bungler, but he's the servant of the bungler, is trying to come up with a plan. And he says, quote, I chose that fiction for our little scheme since folk are often in romantic works kidnapped at sea by buccaneering Turks, are thought to be dead for 15 years or more, then turn up smiling at their kinfolk's door. I've read a hundred stories in that vein. Let's steal the plot. It will save us mental strain, end quote. And he's writing in 1655. And if we accept that the height of Ottoman power was around the second siege of Vienna in 1683, then this is still leading up to that apex. We're talking about a period in which Ottoman and Turkish strength was still ascendant. And apparently stories about people being kidnapped by, they might have said Turkish pirates, but they very well could have been Arab or something else. But by... Ottoman pirates was common enough in practice that not only were there lots of stories written about it, but Moliere could put in his play a reference to all these stories and the audience wouldn't think that was strange. I like these details and I bring them up a lot because they sometimes confirm something that you already suspected. For example, if you'd asked me, would I think that Europeans at that time would have been aware of Ottoman pirates capturing ships and selling people into slavery, I would say probably they'd be aware of that. But I wouldn't be totally sure. News didn't travel at that time the same way that it does now. Maybe they didn't hear about it, or maybe it didn't happen too much, or there may be some other reason. But here we have one data point, not necessarily about historical fact. It's not about how many ships were captured in this way. But it's a measurement of the public perception of this phenomenon at that time. And I like trying to catalog details like that. And literature can be a rich source of them. Later in the play, one of the bungler's rivals, the bungler is trying to marry a girl, and this other guy is also trying to marry her. But the other guy's father doesn't like that girl. He's trying to convince his son to forget about her and to marry somebody else. And the father says, quote, no man is always wise. We've all transgressed, but the shortest errors always are the best, end quote. That was just a short line that I liked. And the bungler's servant throughout the play is trying to come up with schemes so that his master can marry this girl. And the girl is also interested in the bungler, but there's some obstacles in the way. And the plot of the story basically revolves around how the servant is continuously coming up with new schemes for how to get these two together. And the bungler keeps accidentally messing them up. And that's why he's the bungler. And at one point, the servant says, quote, Oh my, what a busy day or two I've spent. How many tricks a scoundrel must invent. End quote. And the plays have not a lot, but a few small self-aware winks in them. For example, in this one, there's a line toward the end that says, quote, Like the ending of a comedy, just now that ancient gypsy woman. End quote. And an old gypsy woman comes and somehow wraps up the plot in a neat way. And... Moliere is sort of making fun of himself at that point. And in The Misanthrope, he actually refers to another one of his plays. One of the characters says, we're sitting here talking like those two characters in The School for Wives. And meanwhile, they're in a different play. And in Lover's Quarrels, there's a nice line for the skeptic, quote, such theorizing, sir, is not for me. I put my trust in what my eyes can see, end quote, which is a good operating principle in general. And the plays give us a few glimpses of some customs that were in place at the time. And some of them remain today. In Lover's Quarrels, the father of one of the women in the play is talking about 
one of the young men, and he says, quote, That is, he could have been obedient to custom and applied for my consent, rather than be perverse and give offense to decency by this absurd pretense, end quote. So clearly there was a custom at the time where the groom-to-be would first go talk to the father of the woman that he wanted to marry. And of course, we're still familiar with that today, but it's interesting to see that it was there in 17th century Paris. And Richard Wilbur gives some concise commentary before each of these plays. And they're very short. They're not long-winded and self-indulgent. In fact, I almost wish they were longer because they're so interesting. And they're written by somebody who worked on these plays, on translating these plays very carefully. So it feels like he knows them very well. But in a passage about the imaginary cuckold, first he's quoting somebody else. He writes, And the play is called Sconarelle, or The Imaginary Cuckold. That's the full name. But he writes, quote, One would call it a farce, a French critic writes of Sconarelle, if it were not written in verse. And that's the end of the French critic's quotation. And then Wilbur goes on, Certainly it is true that Molière's third verse comedy, by wedding broad effects to a now polished poetic technique, makes it hard to speak confidently of low comedy or high. It is somewhat as if a comic strip had been rendered in oils, end quote. That's how a lot of this feels, really. It's a very vivid description from this great poet, Richard Wilbur. He says that these plays, specifically he's talking about this one, but I think others could be described that way, at least a little, as a comic strip that had been painted using oils. It's this mixture of high art and really farcical comedy. And in The Imaginary Cuckold, the father of one of the women in the story is trying to discourage her about something. Quote, this is what comes, young lady, of your addiction to all these volumes of romantic fiction. End quote. And this is pointing at the idea, even in the middle of the 17th century, that women or anybody reading too much fiction, especially romantic fiction, would skew their view of reality and their behavior. Not necessarily making them immoral, but it might make them unrealistic in some way. And that's interesting because we might have that idea today. You might have a character in a TV show who reads too many novels and wants her life to look like one of those novels. But it's interesting to see that idea all the way back in the 17th century. And there's a novel of Jane Austen. It's one of her early novels that I think deals with this also. I haven't read any Jane Austen yet, but my wife really likes Jane Austen. Eventually, I'll have to get to those. But I know there's one of them, I think, that takes this as a central idea. Moliere's plays are interesting in that they have a message or they have some commentary on something. But in general, what they say, they do not preach it. There's not some character standing up and saying what the play is about. But there are some side comments that will sometimes make it a little clear or maybe it's a little bit of Moliere saying something to the audience. And this next passage is an example of that on a topic that remains relevant and controversial today. Quote, A curse on the demented person who first thought of such a stupid bugaboo and tied the honor of a man to what his wife may do if she's a fickle slut. The guilty one should pay in such a case. Why must our honor suffer in her place? The wrongs that others do are charged to us. And if our spouses prove adulterous, we husbands are to shoulder all the blame. They're shameless, and it's we who bear the shame. This is a rank injustice and should be corrected by some statute or decree. Aren't there sufficient woes and sufferings that plague us in the normal course of things? Don't sickness, lawsuits, hunger, thirst, and strife sufficiently beset us in this life without our adding to them by conceiving another and quite baseless cause for grieving? Away with this chimera and its fears. I'll groan no more and shed no further tears. If my wife's done wrong, it's she who should lament. Why should I weep when I am innocent? End quote. All six of the plays that I read, they're all about relations between men and women. Sometimes it's love, sometimes it's just sex. But this is a central topic in all of them so far in a way that it's not so central in Shakespeare. Shakespeare, for instance, has more plays about who is stabbing who and for what reason. So far, I haven't really seen that in Moliere. But one topic that comes up in a few of them of Moliere's plays is cuckoldry, the cheating of a woman on her husband, and then the social position of the husband. And this passage is an argument against the stigma on the husband in that case, 
He's saying it's not the husband's fault, it's the woman's fault. And why should it be a point of our honor? And in America today, I think it's reasonably common as it should be that if one spouse or the other cheats, the couple gets divorced. And maybe that's not necessary in every single case. It might depend on the length of the marriage or the circumstances or whatever. But I think in most cases, that's probably a good response. But there are some cultures, for example, Muslim culture, in which it might go a step further. And that response is that if your daughter or sister has extramarital sex, it's reasonable to kill her to maintain both her honor and the honor of the family and everybody's honor before God. This is sort of a religious honor rather than a social one, though there's obviously a big social component to it. And I think that extramarital sex is basically harmful for society in the long term. And that's why there have evolved so many taboos against it and so many disparate cultures. It might very well be because the culture that is too permissive of this does not last very long. And so the cultures that remain are the ones that control this more tightly. And this is true both of sex between two people who are not married to anyone, as well as sex between two people who one or both of them might be married, but they're not married to each other. And to put my argument for this briefly, I would say that sex invariably can lead to pregnancy, even if you use various forms of birth control. And children who are raised by other than two parents who are married statistically come out much worse off than children who are raised by two married parents. A higher crime rate, less money, less education, all kinds of things. So the result is that if we value somebody's education, their ability to earn money, and the degree to which they do not commit crimes, children who are born to unmarried parents are going to be less solid individuals for the society. And if this spreads enough, then the society as a whole weakens. And who knows what happens after that reaches a certain level. And it's also a statistical fact that the percentage of children born out of wedlock has exploded since the 1970s. It's been on a continual increase and there is no sign of it slowing down. In fact, the permissiveness and normalization on this culture seems to be increasing, not decreasing. Anyway, all of this makes it very interesting to read Moliere and his thoughts on this topic. And I do think, coming back to that passage that I just read, that if you have a couple and one of them cheats, whether it's the man or the woman, that's only a reflection on that person and their character. It's not a reflection on the other person. And maybe the other person was not attentive enough in some way. But if the other is dissatisfied with that, the proper response is to end the relationship and go find a relationship with somebody that satisfies you. I've heard that in France, it's more likely for married couples to have lovers, that a woman would have her husband and then she would have her boyfriend. And this is a reasonably normal state of affairs. And it might be the same for the husband has his wife and then his girlfriend. And of course, this isn't true in every case. And if if there are any French people listening, I would love to hear a little more clarification on this, and maybe I'm completely wrong. But in a general sense, I've heard that this is a little bit more common in France than it is in some other places. And I googled around a little bit and I couldn't find anything really decisive. But it's interesting to see the traces of that all the way back in the 17th century. You have these plays that take this up as a topic. How should we think about cuckoldry? How should we think about relations between men and women? So clearly this was an interesting debate at the time. It was something that people were talking about and thinking about. And I'm curious about how that sort of thing develops. Why is it that, again, if this is true and I'm not completely wrong, that this culture, this type of relationship gradually takes place in France and not, say, in Norway? And one statistic I did see is that apparently the French and the Italians are the most likely to have a secondary lover when they're married. And of course, this is self-reported. We don't know what the actual numbers are in any case. And I didn't even look at all the countries that were surveyed in that piece that I looked at. So it might just be that France and Italy are the most permissive of this. And so people are more candid about reporting it. But that in itself reflects something, even just the permissiveness of the culture. Because if it's more permissive, it's probably more likely that it would happen. Though I'm not completely sure of that, that's a little bit of an assumption. But one thing to notice about Italy and France is that these are the two places in Europe 
that arguably have been the most civilized for the longest time, barring perhaps Greece. It might be interesting to see where Greece falls on this topic. But in Italy, of course, you have the remnants of the Roman Empire. And in France, you have the beginnings of what later became the Holy Roman Empire. That is Charles the Great, as we saw looking at the Song of Roland, is the western part of the Roman Empire. Roman Gaul kind of reforms under the Carolingian dynasty a few hundred years later. Anyway, France was viewed as the most civilized place in Europe for a long time. And of course, what we today call Italy was the center of world power for half a millennium. And I'm not sure what to do with that, just because two things occur side by side, that you have old centers of cultural and political power side by side with relatively permissive sexual culture. Just because those things exist side by side doesn't even mean that they're related. They might share a totally separate cause. They might both be effects. But it's interesting to notice. By the way, when I say that Moliere's plays largely revolve around the relations between men and women, I don't mean that they're all about this topic of what to do about women who cheat on their husbands. For example, two of them, School for Wives and School for Husbands, are about something related but different. And that's arguably more interesting and more significant for some of what society is facing today. And that is the question of how to raise young people so that they behave as they should, according to society's rules. Some people think that School for Wives is a slightly more developed version of School for Husbands. And there's something to be said for that because the plays have a lot of similarities. But what they're generally about is a man who has a young woman in his care who he wants to marry. That by itself is weird by modern standards. In both cases, I think it's an adopted daughter who is now coming of the age to be married. She's turning 18 or whatever, and the guy wants to marry her. But we can set that aside. And by the way, in both cases, he doesn't. So maybe Moliere didn't approve of that sort of thing anyway. But the way that it's talked about, it seems like it was a little bit more normal at the time than it would be today. That would be pretty strange if you did that today. But also in both cases, there's a very strict man who tries to control these young women by essentially not letting them go anywhere. And in the latter case, the guy even tries not to teach the woman very much. He tries to keep her sort of dumb so that she's easier to manipulate. And in both cases, spoiler, the women run away. So those are obviously very extreme. Hardly anybody would advocate lowering women's education so that they don't know about the world and don't want to go get mixed up in it. So the Taliban once again recently banned sixth grade education in Afghanistan. But the argument that they give is not that women shouldn't be educated at all. It's that they shouldn't be in an environment that's mixed. They shouldn't be in an environment that's men and women or boys and girls together after sixth grade. But I'm sure there are plenty among them who would say that education confuses women and it's better if they don't get it. So I guess I can't say that there's nobody who would do that today, but there's very few people, certainly in the West, in Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, the places that are largely the heirs of European culture. Pretty much nobody would argue that that's the way forward. But there is a difficulty here which is that Moliere, it sometimes seems, was arguing with the luxury of not yet seeing the consequence of what he was arguing for, a greater level of permissiveness. That if you constrain people, and he was talking about women, but you could say the same thing of young men. If you constrain young people, all you're going to do is provoke them further, so you might as well not make a big deal out of it and try to teach them how to make good decisions. And I think this is a kind of idealistic view of human nature. And I think if Moliere could see what's going on today, which is largely the effect of that kind of thinking, for example, if you could explain to Moliere what OnlyFans was, he might talk about this a little differently. Part of the ongoing conversation of culture is what are the restrictions that we put on our society? And I'm not talking about governmental restrictions. I'm talking about social restrictions. What are the things for which people reward and punish each other? If you do this, I like it, and I signal to you that you have a high social status in my eyes. And if you do that, I don't like it, and I signal the opposite. And then there are the things for which I signal nothing. Those are the things considered normal. What human actions fit into these three categories? There is a conversation to be had there, but the idea that any restriction that you put on anything to discourage anything will only provoke it further is simply patently untrue. 
There's all kinds of social pressure against murdering people. I think almost nobody is provoked to murder because there's a social taboo against it. Nobody, when they're a young rebel, wants to prove themselves by killing somebody. And before you say soldiers, young guys who join the military are, on the contrary, not doing it because it's rebellious, though in some cases they might be rebelling against their family. That is a context in which killing, if you end up in one of the military positions that involves killing, is an act not of rebellion, but of conformity. The whole society submits to the government. The government has decided that these people are enemies and we need to kill them. And then the military goes out and kills them. That's not rebellion. That's conformity. Anyway, this argument that any kind of social restriction, any kind of social pressure not to do something is entirely fruitless, I think is a bad argument and it doesn't withstand scrutiny. Now, the depictions of the men in the school for wives and the school for husbands is, I think, accurate because they're both so overblown. They're both so restrictive of the women who are in their care that there's no way that those women will do anything except rebel. However, that doesn't mean that any effort to encourage certain behaviors and discourage other behaviors is fruitless. But that, of course, requires an open debate about what is good and bad behavior, keeping in mind both individual concerns and collective concerns. Anyway, I think I've made my point. We can get back to some passages now. And The Imaginary Cuckold is a play that in part is about how things can get so confused by people making bad assumptions and thinking they know something that they don't know. It's also a very nice case for skepticism, for going slowly. And indeed, the play ends with these lines, quote, But as you've seen in matters of this kind, appearances can deceive the keenest mind. Remember my example and be wise. When things look simple, don't believe your eyes. End quote. And now we're into the school for husbands. It begins with a discussion between two men about some of the things that I was talking about earlier. And interestingly, the character who turns out to be right, though it's not obvious at the beginning, the character who's arguing, the brother who's arguing for letting the women in your charge go out about town and talk to young men and go to parties and things, he then says, quote, but it is bad on any ground to shun the norm and not to do the thing that's done. Better by far to join the foolish throng than stand alone and call the whole world wrong, end quote. I think that's absolutely untrue. Better by far to join the foolish throng than stand alone and call the whole world wrong. Could it be easier to disagree with anything? And that's the character whose position is confirmed by the subsequent events in the play. So maybe that's a hint that Moliere actually doesn't agree with that position, but he might say that it's the way things are. He says, but it is bad on any ground to shun the norm and not do the thing that's done. He might not say that it's right, it's just what people do, and so we ought to go along with it. Which I disagree with that too, but that's different from not being able to anticipate the long-term effects of a position, which almost nobody can do ever, so we couldn't blame him for that. And that character also is the one who's more in favor of following fashionable dress. The main man in this play, whose name is also Sconarell, this name is used a few times in these plays, He's more strict in trying to control his adopted daughter, and he's also more conventional in dress. He dresses in a way that's a little bit more old-fashioned. And those two things together bring to mind a sort of caricature of somebody who's both very conventional mentally and conventional sartorially. But then you have the other brother, Arist, who is both more permissive of the young woman for whom he's responsible, and also more interested in dressing fashionably, even though he's an older guy. I think he's 60 and Sconarell is like 40. He's an older guy, but he likes to try to keep up with fashionable dress. And also he's more permissive. Whereas Sconarell is younger, relatively, but more conventional in certain ways. And neither of these two, maybe this is part of what makes it such a nice play, neither of these two look very heroic and the other looks very absurd. Sconarell is made to look a little bit dumb by what happens next, but Ariste also looks sort of goofy. He's just going along with the fashion of the times. He's an older guy who's dressing like a young guy trying to look cool. Neither of these two are obviously the hero and the other obviously the villain. There's something to criticize in both of them, which I think makes it a more sophisticated commentary. And by the way, when I started making this podcast, I didn't say to myself, every time somebody mentions Turkey or Turks in an old book, I'm going to talk about that. But since I have 
learned Turkish and lived in Turkey for a while and have some experience with this culture, it is interesting to see, on the one hand, what I consider my heritage, European heritage, colliding with Turkey and Turks historically, since I know something about both cultures. And it's interesting to see how often Turks do come up in European literature. They were a looming, menacing threat for several centuries. The charge of Arist, talking about the charge of Sganarel, that is the young woman whose guardian is more permissive, talking about the other woman whose guardian is less permissive, says, quote, yes, all these stern precautions are inhuman. Are we in Turkey where they lock up women? It's said that females there are slaves or worse, and that's why Turks are under heaven's curse, end quote. So that perception existed at the time, too, that women in Turkey or women in the Middle East had a harder time than women in Europe. And by the way, I think that's accurate for a number of reasons. And it's interesting that in thinking about this, about relations between men and women and how they should be, even today, even without this prompting, I couldn't help but compare what is normal today, for example, in the United States with what's normal in Turkey. And that's also what they did 400 years ago. This is why it's good to read old books, because you might think that you're thinking something original and somebody wrote that stuff down a long time ago and you're not thinking anything original. So you can avoid wasting some time by getting caught up on what people already have figured out or thought and then go from there rather than walking down well-worn paths thinking you're a frontiersman. This next passage is from the next play, The School for Wives, which, as I mentioned, is related to The School for Husbands, but it's a bit different. And this is the guy who has raised his adopted daughter to be naive and innocent and not know anything about the world. That is, he actually tried not to educate her, and she later figures this out and resents him for it. But talking to another guy, he says, quote, a man's not simple to take a simple wife. Your wife, no doubt, is a wise, virtuous woman, but brightness, as a rule, is a bad omen. And I know men who've undergone much pain because they married girls with too much brain. I want no intellectual, if you please, who'll talk of nothing but her Tuesday teas, who'll frame lush sentiments in prose and verse and fill the house with wits and fops and worse, while I, as her dull husband, stand above like a poor saint whose candles have gone out. No, keep your smart ones. I have no taste for such. Women who versify know far too much. I want a woman whose thought is not sublime, who has no notion what it is to rhyme, and who indeed, if she were asked in some insipid parlor game what rhymes with drum would answer in all innocence, a fife. In short, I want an unaccomplished wife, and there are four things only she must know. To say her prayers, love me, spin, and sew. End quote. That passage sums up that guy's position, and that character himself is a merchant, so he's not dumb, certainly, but he is paralyzed by his fear of being made to look foolish. The thing he wants most of all is to make sure that his wife doesn't cheat on him, and that's why he has this rather extreme position. But it is exactly that position that eventually makes the young woman realize what's going on, and she plans her escape. And the last of the plays that we're going to be looking at is Don Juan. And I somehow have been vaguely aware of the character of Don Juan. If you hear that name, you probably know that he's some kind of a womanizer. If you say of a guy that he's a Don Juan, most people know that you're saying that he flirts with a lot of women or women like him or something like that. And I've known of the Mozart opera Don Giovanni, but I somehow had never connected those two things. I never realized that the Mozart opera was about that story because I didn't know the story in any detail. And Moliere didn't originally write it. It was originally written by a Spanish Catholic monk and poet and dramatist named Gabriel Tellez, though he's better known as Tirso de Molina. The origin of the story is his play called The Trickster of Seville and the Stone Guest, and it was published in Spain in about 1630. And Moliere's version was published in 1665, so about 35 years later. But in his introductory notes about the play, Wilbur writes, quote, Is Don Juan himself a comic figure? Yes. It may be that his disbelief in heaven is a deficiency, like his inability to love a woman. But it comes across as aggressive and cocksure, and that makes him comic in the circumstances of this play. Just as it was comic for certain English scientists presented in 1798 with the skin of a duck-billed platypus to declare it a hoax because it did not fit into their rigid scheme of nature. End quote. So I looked into that. And apparently, the duck-billed platypus, which had feet like an otter and a bill like a duck, and it laid eggs, 
and had a tail like a beaver, and it was venomous. This animal discovered in Australia, certainly related to Captain James Cook's expeditions over there. When British scientists got reports of this, they thought it must have been made up. They didn't think it was real because it was too different from what they expected to be true. And this is an interesting cognitive problem that humans have that we'll have to go into another day because it is complicated and interesting. But if something doesn't fit into what we think is true, then we're more likely to hold to our beliefs than to the new information. And on the one hand, this is important because this is partially how we filter information at all. We say, how does it compare with what we already know? But in certain cases, it can make you completely wrong. And the discovery of the duck-billed platypus is an interesting example of that. Early on, Sconarell, who here that name is used for Don Juan's servant. I don't know if there was a shortage of names in 17th century Paris, but Moliere reuses names a lot. Here he says, quote, The person you've known as Don Juan, my master, is the greatest scoundrel who ever walked the earth. A mad dog, a demon, a Turk, a heretic who doesn't believe in heaven or hell or werewolves even, end quote. And even Don Juan has plenty of jokes in it. But I wanted to read that line because there the word Turk is slipped in between demon and heretic. Mad dog, demon, Turk, heretic. And I'll have to show some of my Turkish friends that one. One thing to note is that Don Juan is a little bit later in Moliere's career, and it is not in verse. It's mostly not in verse. It's mostly prose. And Wilbur also translated it that way, in prose rather than in verse. Apparently, in general, Moliere's earlier plays tend to be in verse. And then as he got older, maybe he got a little more confident and he wanted to focus on the action and the rhythm of the drama rather than the rhythm of the words so much. And so he started to use prose more than verse. And there's a relatively long speech of Don Juan's that on the one hand, describes Don Juan's view of the world in part, but also I think part of the intention here, whether or not it was the intention, part of the effect is certainly to show how even people who have totally nefarious intentions can dress up what they're saying in a lot of nice language, and this is something to watch out for. And keep in mind, Don Juan is not just a womanizer, and by the way, being a womanizer in the 17th century was much worse than it is now because you were going around basically wrecking women, destroying their social status by promising to marry them, sleeping with them, and then not marrying them. So today, when somebody says womanizer, unfortunately, it can be seen as a little bit charming. And in those days, it was a much more pernicious thing. But on top of that, he's also a murderer. He kills a guy, though in Moliere's version, that happens before the play. And he's, of course, lying continuously. So Don Juan is a bad guy. He says, quote, What? You'd have a man tie himself down to the first pretty woman who takes his fancy and forsake the world for her and never look at another? How absurd to make a specious virtue of fidelity and bury oneself forever in a single passion and be dead from youth onward to all the other beauties by whom one might be dazzled. No, no, constancy is for insensitive clods alone. All fair women have the right to enchant us, and the fact that we've met one of them first shouldn't deprive all the rest of their just claim on our hearts. For myself, I'm ravished by beauty wherever I find it, and I yield at once to the sweet violence with which it takes us captive. It's useless for me to pledge my heart and hand. The love I feel for one charming creature can't pledge me to be unjust to the others. I still have eyes for the merits of them all, and I render to each one the tribute that nature exacts of us. I can't, in short, deny my heart to anything that strikes me as lovable, and the sight of a beautiful face so masters me that if I had a thousand hearts, I'd give them all. There is besides an inexpressible charm in the first stirrings of a new passion, and the whole pleasure of love lies in change. It's a delicious thing to subdue the heart of some young beauty by a hundred sweet attentions, to see yourself making some small progress with her every day to combat her modest innocence and her reluctance to surrender with tears and sighs and rapturous speeches, to break through all her little defenses one by one, to vanquish her cherished scruples and gently bring her round to granting your desires. But once one is the master, there's nothing more to say or wish for. 
The joy of passionate pursuit is over, and all that remains is the boredom of a placid affection. Until some new beauty appears and revives one's desires, enchanting the heart with the prospect of a new conquest. To be brief, then, there's nothing sweeter than overcoming the resistance of an attractive woman, and I bring to that enterprise the ambition of a conquering general, who moves on forever from victory to victory and will set no limit on his longings. Nothing can withstand the impetuousness of my desires. I feel my heart capable of loving all the earth, and, like Alexander, I wish that there were still more worlds in which to wage my amorous campaigns, end quote. Later, he sees a young, happy peasant couple, and Don Juan himself is, I don't want to say a nobleman, but he's upper class, and he says, quote, Never had I seen two people so enchanted by each other, so radiantly in love. Their open tenderness and mutual delight moved me deeply, and aroused in me a love that was rooted in jealousy. Yes, from the moment I saw them, I found their shared happiness intolerable. Envy sharpened my desires, and with keenest pleasure I began to consider how I would mar their felicity, and disrupt a union which it pained my heart to behold." End quote. When I was younger, if I'd read that passage, I would have thought it pure fiction. I used to not think that jealousy like that existed. And maybe this kind of jealousy toward total strangers is a little exaggerated, or at least not very common. But people can definitely be jealous in this way of people whom they know. And there is a scene in Don Juan where Don Juan encounters a poor man on the street, a beggar, and he's going to give him some money. But first he asks him a little bit about himself. And the guy says, well, I spend all day praying to God on behalf of all the people who have given me money and I've given my life to God. And he's a very religious beggar. And Don Juan says, well, say something blasphemous and I'll give you this. He offers him an unusual amount of money. And the beggar tries to get him to give him something without this requirement. And Don Juan insists. And in the end, the beggar says, no, I'd rather starve to death. I'm not going to say anything blasphemous. So then Don Juan and his servant go on without giving him any money. And we sometimes think of this test in life of being willing to betray your principles for money. Would you do that? Under what circumstances? And obviously the honorable thing is to never do that. And in this situation, it's not the main character, but a small side character who's basically only in one scene in this play, this poor man, this beggar, who demonstrates that principle. And the title character is not the one who betrays his principles for money, He's the one who's making the offer. And that's a player in that position whom we don't think about so often. We think about somebody who gives up their principles or somebody who doesn't, but we don't often think about the person making the offer. In this case, especially because it's just malicious, Don Juan has nothing to gain. He just thinks it would be funny or something if this religious beggar said something blasphemous and he executed his power over him to get him to do it by offering him this money. Usually when people get others to betray their principles for money, they're at least getting something out of it. That is, the person who's purchasing the betrayal is benefiting somehow. So that is another example of Don Juan's wickedness. And there's another tense scene in this play where Don Juan saves a guy from some robbers. A guy is getting robbed by bandits, and Don Juan jumps in and helps him to fight the bandits off. And so the other guy, they both survive. But then... Don Carlos, who's the guy who Don Juan saved, learns that this person who just saved him is the exact person who he and his buddies were all looking for because he had seduced his sister and they were going to find him and kill him. But now this guy who he had come looking to kill has saved his life. And so he owes him a debt. And then Don Alonso, one of Don Carlos's friends, shows up and says, oh, we should just kill him flat out. This is our guy. Let's kill him. We have the chance. And Don Carlos says, no, he saved my life. We can't kill him. And they go back and forth for a while. And in the end, Don Carlos says, we're going to let you go right now. But when we find you again, we're going to kill you. So be warned. And Don Juan says, I didn't ask you to spare me right now. I'll fight you right now if you want to. But he does take the opportunity and leaves. And that's one more interesting scene in this very fast moving play of Moliere. None of these are boring. If you're not somebody who usually reads plays, I recommend starting with Moliere. They are all interesting and funny and fast moving. And as I said before, these translations by Richard Wilbur are just astonishing. To get the two volume set is a tiny bit on the expensive side. So maybe if you're a student, you can save it for later or try to pick it up somewhere. But if you can afford it, I think these are definitely worth owning. 
Toward the end of the play, Don Juan makes the decision to pose as a hypocrite, that is, to pretend to be religious when he's not really. And he's defending this move, and he says, quote, It's no longer shameful to be a dissembler. Hypocrisy is now a fashionable vice, and all fashionable vices pass for virtues. End quote. All fashionable vices pass for virtues. In his context, he's talking about religion, but that might be applicable in different ways today. Fashionable vices that pass for virtues. And then winding up with this interview that's at the end of the volume, an interview with Richard Wilbur. There's a couple points I wanted to look at. The interviewer asks, can you describe your process of translating Moliere? And Wilbur answers, quote, I read the play, mostly unassisted by scholarship or criticism, and get to know its characters and milieu. Then I render it couplet by couplet, aiming for a maximum fidelity to sense, form, and tone. My chief virtue as a translator is stubbornness. I will spend a whole spring day, a perfect day for tennis, getting one or two lines right, end quote. And when I read that, I said, well, that's how you make a translation like this. That's how they came out like this, is that Richard Wilbur was willing to spend all day on one or two lines, and he called that stubbornness. That's a funny way to think about it. At another point, the Interviewer asks, how does Moliere speak to contemporary American audiences? Wilbur answers, Moliere's language is readily understood by any American audience. So are the plots of his major comedies, which study the effect of an unbalanced central figure on those about him. Moliere's idea of what is normal, natural, or balanced is very much like our own, so there's no need for updating. I have no patience with the sort of director who, thinking to render Alceste accessible, has him dress and behave like a hippie who tells it like it is. That did happen once and I have not forgotten it. But he says, his major comedies study the effect of an unbalanced central figure on those about him. That's 10 or 12 words that, if you look at each of these comedies, really succinctly sums up what's going on. An unbalanced central figure and his effect on those around him. And then finally, the interviewer asks, do you have any advice for poets or playwrights who want to translate or produce classical theater? Wilbur answers, I would urge such translators to do their work faithfully and straight and to insist on the same qualities in any production, death to adaptations and adulterations. So he didn't like adaptations. And those are the passages that I wanted to read from Moliere. Going over six plays at once is really far too much. Any one of these plays could be examined much more closely. But I do look forward to reading the remaining four translations in the second volume. I'll have to see if there are any videos made of productions from these translations, because they'd be very interesting to watch, though they're good to read as well. And while these six plays, as I mentioned, did center on relations between men and women, and so in that way they're a little bit limited in that they don't give a really full picture of everything that life is about. There's not a lot of political intrigue, for example, in these plays, or there isn't somebody sacrificing for art or for a cause that they believe in, or really intense revenge, or even the kinds of historical dramas that Schiller wrote. But relations between men and women are a big part of our lives. If you're a man and you're married, you have your wife and your relationship with her. If you're single, you have your girlfriend. You're trying to figure that out. Moliere gives us a lot to think about in that section of life. And maybe he was challenging some of the views at the time, or maybe he was going along with an emerging fashion. It's hard to know. That would take a little bit more sociological history of that time period to put these in context, what was going on at the time, how would these have been received, what was public opinion like at that time. But either way, these are questions we clearly have not yet sufficiently answered. How should men and women get along? How should their relationships be characterized? And if you want to look at some of these questions mixed in with some excellent jokes and beautiful language, then Moliere's plays are an excellent place to start. And I do want to add one thing. I'm only about an act or two into The Misanthrope, which is the first play in the second volume. And that one already, I haven't finished it, so I don't know. But it doesn't look like it's about romance. It looks like it's about a guy and his relationship to society. So... My theory so far about Moliere generally being about a certain thing might already be broken, and it might just be that the first six that I looked at are in that category. But if you enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll go either to my website, or now I finally have my book available on Amazon, this edition of Frankenstein that I printed. I'm very happy with it. I have an original cover, 97 footnotes that define some of the more unusual terms and references that Mary Shelley uses. 
The print quality of the book is very good. I have it at a good price, free shipping anywhere in the United States. And again, if you'd rather use Amazon, I now have it on Amazon. I'll put the link in the description. You can also get it on my website. Frankenstein is an excellent book. If you haven't read it, you should. If you have read it, you should get it for somebody that you know who hasn't. Given emerging technologies, its message has never been more relevant. And it's very easy to read, very interesting, very thought-provoking, very discussion-provoking. I think everybody should have a copy of this book at home that they have read and contemplated. And I would think that even if I weren't selling it, keep that in mind. I decided to sell this book and then printed it. I didn't have a bunch of copies of it that I now need to convince you to buy. I printed it because I think it's valuable and I think people should read it. So buy your copy today. I'll put it in the mail. I'll put it in the mail. It'll be at your doorstep within the week. And the rest is up to you. Farewell until next time. Take care and happy reading.